And thank you, Tim, for inviting me to join you guys here today. Um, and in part, I'm really glad to be here because I think Tim and I and Karen also have been thinking on parallel tracks. And so it's exciting to talk metaphors. Um, and uh, so part of this presentation is actually coming from an article I wrote for DIS magazine um, for their big data issue. And uh, so it's, it's largely drawing from that work, but it also goes back into um, work that I did on the quantified self community and how they were talking about uh, their, the metaphors that they use to describe their relationship to their personal data. So I'm going to kind of walk through the existing metaphors that we use to talk about data. Um, largely coming from an industrial context, um, trying to identify some of the problems that I think are, or the things that are missing from those uh, char characterizations of data, um, and try to propose some pr uh, interesting alternatives to ways that we might personalize uh, our relationship to data. Um, and then lastly, I really want to open the discussion up into talking about um, ways that these alternatives might get adopted or towards what ends we are applying these, uh, these metaphors, and for what audiences. Uh, but before I get started, it's probably worth talking a little bit more about where I come to ask about metaphors. So in part, as I mentioned, um, this was coming out of the quantified self research I did at Oxford Internet Institute. It was largely ethnographically informed interviews with um, individuals who are part of the uh, community or posting in the community forums. Um, and so I did a kind of discourse analysis of how uh, they were talking about uh, the way that they were thinking about data. Um, but before that, I was an analyst at, uh, well, as, as a subsidiary of Gartner, um, the place that is like building the uh, metaphors and naming the conventions of, of larger trends in technology and like mapping them on the hype cycle. Um, so I was kind of seeing it from the, how are we, ta how are we starting to describe these industrial um, technology shifts? Um, and even further back, I've been thinking a lot uh, as an undergrad uh, from uh, media studies and English, um, talking about the relationship between analog and digital, especially in terms of the shift in media, um, even film and celluloid, what, what is film uh, studies as it becomes a digital medium. Um, so the kind of relationship uh, analog to digital analogy um, is part of what inspires me to, to work on this. Um, so with that, um, this, I'm standing right in front of this. Um, so when we do a Google image search, we get a lot of abstract binaries, ones and zeros, to describe uh, what we think data is or looks like. Um, we see a lot of this cool electric blue that's supposed to so say something about the kind of <coughs> computer, the binary. But it's really not telling us anything about what data is. Um, it's still very intangible. Um, it's trying to be structured. It might be Star Trek. Um, so, I, so this is kind of the visual instantiation of a, a metaphor for data. Um, but when we talk about data, we, we try to make it a little bit more concrete, tangible, and then we use physical metaphors to do so. But then we end up with some really absurd uh, metaphors. So this is a t-shirt from uh, Cloudera, which is the Hadoop and Apache big data company. Um, in this case, I think the metaphor here is data is new blank. Um, data is the new oil. It's kind of riffing off that. Um, but really, the kind of core conceptual framing here is that data is new and novel and trendy. Um, we see this in the ways that um, headlines are talking about data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century. Um, so I sort of wonder, like, okay, how, how is it that we get here? How is it that we start talking about data as the new bacon? Um, who's talking about it that way? What, uh, what is it doing to, to describe it as such? And so I'm borrowing very heavily from uh, Lake Off and Johnson's Metaphors We Live By. Um, this is very much a kind of philosophical approach to the role that language plays in our lives. Um, and the main concept here is the, uh, the idea of the conceptual metaphor. So they're not just talking about 
metaphors as a linguistic or, or literature uh, tool, but rather that they are uh, so foundational that they frame the way that we think. This is the, the idea of the conceptual metaphor. Um, and so these are the kinds of metaphors uh, that are so foundational that we kind of forget that they're a metaphor at all. Uh, so for example, the key uh, example that they use is argument is war. Um, so you hear people saying things like, your claims are indefensible. He attacked every point, weak point in my argument. His criticisms were right on target. So all of those words kind of come from war, which also basically uh, confines the possible things that are outcomes of an argument, right? There are winners and losers. It completely structures the, um, the content and the kind of uh, dynamic of that interaction. Same with the idea of time is money. So people say, you're wasting my time. This gadget will save you hours. I don't have the time to give to you. How do you spend your time these days? These things are so fundamentally ingrained, this, this equation between time and money as having these uh, limited resource kind of values associated with it. So Lakoff and Johnson basically are really talking about the kind of most fundamental ways that uh, the metaphor is framing the way we think about a thing. And I think all technology has always related in some ways either as analogies or metaphors especially as we adopt new technologies, right? So this gets back to the, the idea of the trendy thing. Um, metaphors, especially visual ones or interface ones, introduce the new technologies into our lives and find ways to familiarize ourselves with the new thing. So when the television entered the living room, it was literally framing the cathode ray tube with wood to make it a domestic piece of furniture in the living room. Uh, so it would fit in with everything else around it. There is no reason that this had to be designed that way, uh, but it was a piece of furniture. And then the same is true of early cinema, uh, where the proscenium arch of the theater was actually reified into the um, frame of the uh, kind of those title pages or title um, in insets. Um, and so this is coming from uh, Bolter and Grusin's work on remediated, remediation as new technologies take on the uh, features of old technologies as a reference point to kind of uh, introduce us to w the way we should think about them. And this is also true in the, the digital realm in the visual metaphors of skew skeuomorphisms. Um, so we have things like legal pads and tape recorders and felt gaming tables to create these analogs to show, teach us how we should be using this technology. But they also start to fall away as the devices become more familiar to us and we understand that this is how we're supposed to use the Notes app. So I think the, the important thing and the reason why I'm spending so much time thinking about metaphors is that uh, these metaphors are both ways of uh, teaching us how to think about things, but they also can uh, just as easily obscure or misrepresent things. Or, uh, have power dynamics involved in who gets to define what those metaphors are. So, and Lakoff and Johnson make this clear, the people who get to impose their metaphors on culture get to define what we consider to be true. So this is in part why I'm really interested in how dominant the uh, industrial metaphors are uh, for data that have uh, basically largely structured the public discourse about how we talk about data. Um, especially in the media and uh, for kind of consumer purposes. And in part, I'm trying to trace the um, kind of trajectory of where these uh, metaphors are coming from, from Gartner and O'Reilly and The Economist, even as they kind of trickle in from the business world into uh, a wider adoption. So uh, I also want to take a moment to point out um, Karen and uh, Tim's piece, which does a really great job of characterizing these metaphors um, as uh, being natural and talking about the cloud in terms of uh, having multiple liquid and, uh, what is it, Ga gaseous liquid and solid states. Um, but uh, I want to also talk through a, little, a few more of the uh, industrial metaphors that we're, we're talking about here. So 
when we see things talking about like the we're learning to cope with the data deluge and working out how to best tap into it, um, it's describing data as this natural resource, but it's also describing the kind of liquid nature of, of data. And I think there's apt uh, usefulness in, in describing the fluid qualities, the liquid qualities, and but it's also positioning it at this, as this uh, disastrous, overwhelming, um, uncontrollable force that we can't control the flow of. When we talk a lot about data as an exhaust, and I think in Bruce Schneier's book, that's one of the um, metaphors that he really latches onto um, in the introduction and conclusion, this is trying to position data as uh, a byproduct, which is the natural or the um, necessary output of a transactional system, uh, but it also suggests that it's wasteful, pollutive, um, it's kind of uh, diffuse, it doesn't mean anything, but it has these very negative uh, potentials for the environment around us. And then this most popular one, data as the industrial product, so data is the new oil. This is, a, I think, from Cisco. Um, so talking about data as the new oil or we're mining the data for insights suggests that da data again is a natural resource that has great value to be mined and refined but that it must be handled by experts and large-scale industrial processes to be made into this shooting wi-fi oil um, and data is, is the new oil's interesting even within the industry itself so i was speaking to a programmatic advertising uh, executive and he said oh I really don't like data is the new oil metaphor I like to think of it as data is uh, the steel of the digital economy uh, and in part he's trying to avoid the negative connotations of the oil industry that this uh, evokes but he's also express expressing a concern about the monopolizing forces of Google and Facebook so kind of hearkening to this steel age uh, monopolization which was an interesting shift. So these dominant industrial metaphors that we're using do not actually privilege the position of the person. There are no humans involved here. Uh, they, they're taking the person out of this equation uh, and very much uh, are uh, kind of positioned with the institution that is using the data or creating the data. And so as an individual, it's kind of this obscure field of data is out there, but I don't have any way of, of grasping it. And so I think these make a lot of business and economic sense, but not particularly sense as individuals in a data-driven society, which I think we are all excited about spending more time thinking about here at Data and Society. So uh, Jared Thorpe actually tries to bridge this connection between the oil metaphor and the kind of personal or like embodied reality that I'm, tr I'm hoping to get at. He says, where oil is composed of the compressed bodies of long dead microorganisms, this personal data is made from the compressed fragments of our personal lives. It is a dense condensate of our human experience. And I kind of like that because he's trying to resolve the lack of human in, in all of these metaphors. But I'm not really sure that salvaging the data, <laughs> data is the new oil metaphor is doing us any good. So I go back to Lakoff, Lakoff and Johnson in their further discussion about the importance of embodied cognition. So they're talking a lot about philosophy. Um, Lakoff's background is uh, philosophy and embodied philosophy. So uh, w some of the things that they're talking about in the most um, fundamental metaphors that we have, uh, things like good is up or bad is down or vice versa, um, up is good, down is bad, are so foundationally uh, really about our relationship to the world as, as embodied beings. Uh, these are orientational and spati spatialized metaphors. Um, so I think their fundamental suggestion of good is up is that you are upright and not sick. You are not lying down, you are not dead. So up generally is a better state than like what you are when you're lying down. Um, and that's quite, that's as foundational and fundamental as they're, as they're getting with talking about um, embodied metaphors. So uh, 
I, I think my position with the industrial metaphors is that they don't, um, they lack the kind of basic domain experience that Lockoff and Johnson talk about. Uh, of so it's it's privileging the position of the uh, institution, of the corporation, of the kind of socio-technical system, rather than an individual or a person or um, uh, somebody who has a stake in their own personal data. So I'm trying to argue that if we, if the problem is, and I think one of the problems right now is that in the popular discourse, there are, even though we're in the kind of post Snowden, um, we're worried about what Facebook and Google are doing, there's still some, some rhetoric about, well, I still have nothing to hide. Um, and I think that's largely because the uh, kind of visceral personal stakes are not clear enough to enough people. Um, and if that is the case, that we need to start trying to make data effects more personal to people. So in doing so, I'm looking at the quantified self to see how they're talking about this existing personal relationship that they have and trying to see if there's something valuable there in the way that they're describing it. So in the quantified self community, there's a lot of talk about data as a shadow. Um, th this is also somewhat in the kind of uh, popular discourse around the kind of darker sides of data. Um, so it's tying data to a body. There is an actual <laughs> physical person uh, acknowledging the fact that there is uh, an individual tied to this. But it's, all, it's still a kind of byproduct construct, right? It's, this isn't the actual person. It's just a representation of them. Uh, it's a trace of them, but not actually a context uh, context-rich and uh, detailed idea of a person. It's almost like a metadata version of you. Data as a self-portrait is a really interesting one uh, in the way that the quantified self uh, folks are talking about using their data to understand themselves. Um, I like it because it's artistic and interpretive. It's also putting a lot of agency in the person who's creating the data or, or using data as a medium. Uh, in constructing a sense of yourself. But as, uh, so this is Chuck Close, um, it may be still granular and bitty or not yet photorealistic or kind of playing with uh, how photorealistic you may be able to get with your data. And it's still open to interpretation both by the artist and the someone else who might look at that same data and see something different. The quantified self community has also been largely described as, uh, it, especially in the popular press in the kind of 2010 to 2012-ish range, uh, after Gary Wolf started writing about it for the New York Times, as a narcissistic kind of community. And the idea that creating all this data about yourself uh, is time consuming and is kind of this, uh, narcissistic, navel-gazing tendency. But in the quantified self community, when I was doing a lot of research with them and going to the conferences, uh, they were reacting to the fact that this didn't feel like the right kind of characterization. Uh, navel-gazing historically is uh, a means of self-reflection and meditation. Uh, the idea of navel-gazing comes from actually looking inward um, as a positive thing. So uh, they were talking about data as a practice of self-observation. And then lastly, I want to talk about data as a mirror. So the uh, idea, it's, sim it's similar to the self-portrait concept, but this is positioning data as this um, technology for self-reflection. And I, I would argue that maybe the mirror is one of the earliest forms of technology um, for seeing ourselves as others see us. Uh, in this you know, objective state. But like mirrors, data can be distorted, can drive dysmorphic thought, can provide all these other kind of potentially negative aspects of mirrors. So my, my main focus here is I, I'm trying to re, uh, reinsert the individual's interest in their own data by talking about the embodied experience. Um, in particular in, in trying to build out the experiential position. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm wondering if we can even push those embodied metaphors further, as you were saying, Tim, earlier today, 
data is blood, data is DNA. We already talk about DNA in these problematic uh, comparisons of DNA as uh, programming. So can we talk about data as traces of the digital experience, like dust is actually just traces of our skin, data is a fingerprint, like where can we take these? Um, and so I would love to kind of riff on that with you guys a little bit more. And then uh, James Geary, who is, has also written a very good book about uh, metaphors, the eye is the other, um, he's kind of updating Lagoff and Johnson's ideas uh, with some of the um, cognitive research that's been done about the effect of metaphors. Um, he was suggesting when I chatted with him that maybe this embodied metaphor could be about breathing and respiration. And I kind of liked this concept because it's trying to resolve the uh, dualistic or a symbiotic relationship of data. So there's this trans, uh, transpiring, um, you breathe in, you have CO2 come out, uh, but that is running the rest of the system and it goes back and forth. Um, so tr trying to describe data as the carbon system might be interesting. Um, it's still kind of resolving the individual effect, but also the kind of larger ecosystem effect um, and acknowledging that data is running the whole system or the underlying substrate of the system. So none of these are perfect, uh, but I think they're interesting to kind of unpack what it is that they're doing and what positionalities they're kind of privileging or uh, trying to impose. And again, I think this is important not only because the metaphors we're using are ways of clarifying and introducing new ideas, it's also the ways that we shape the way we adopt things in the future. So Sally Wyatt has talked a lot about um, the information superhighway and all of the, meta the spatial metaphors that we use to talk about the internet. Um, and she says, metaphors not only help us think about the future, they are a resource deployed by a variety of actors to shape the future. So in particular with this audience here at Data and Society, I'm really interested in kind of pushing on what means and ends we're trying to apply here in employing some, uh, some particular metaphor for change or for describing an existing situation or um, kind of pushing the public discourse in a different direction or a policy, uh, policy direction, for example. Um, and for me, the, my goal in kind of focusing on the personal side of it, as I said, is, is trying to address this I have nothing to hide mentality. Um, I think some of the reasons that we're still not getting as far as I would like in the, in the kind of popular discourse about our stakes in our personal data is that um, it's not, we don't have enough stories like the uh, target story, uh, the pregnancy story that are like so visceral and so relatable and so personal um, in part because those are hard to surface. Um, and you know, the target story is problematic in a lot of ways as well. But I think what's, what made that a meme and what made it such an uh, effective uh, story was that it was kind of touchy at this personal level. So I'm wondering if there are ways to uh, encourage more of those like visceral reactions. Um, and yeah, so I, I really am hoping to kind of open it up to talk a little bit about what ends to, towards what ends we're applying these metaphors um, if we're talking about, uh, you know, as a think tank or as a think do tank at uh, Data and Society, there's a lot of um, kind of responsibility in choosing the metaphors carefully, right? So what uh, impact does this have going forward? How does it shape the future discourse? How does it um, kind of direct in a certain uh, angle? And I'm also really wondering if there are differences in the ways that we can employ metaphors to, for different audiences. So right, are there the right metaphors for being impactful with policymakers and are they different from consumers, different from corporations? Um, what are meme-worthy metaphors? Um, earlier we were talking a little bit about uh, the kind of process of how metaphors replace each other or, or like start to lose their uh, meaningfulness um, 
and their, their value. Um, and another thing that is totally open for discussion is uh, what role we have, um, or the industrial naming process has in kind of defining what these metaphors are or what these names are for the, for the technology shifts that we're a part of. So with that, I just, I wanna open it up and maybe Tim, if you had some, if you have initial thoughts or. <laughs> Uh, no, I think we, we can open up to the group, and I think I, I can chime in as we, as the discussion gets moving. So um, I'll leave that up. Great. Yeah. So thanks. thanks. Uh, I'm gonna sit so we can actually yeah. discuss. <laughs> I gotta run the microphone around. Yeah. So uh, questions, comments, thoughts. Uh, we'll start over here and work around. Sure. Uh, you just ended by saying the industrial process of naming, and. Uh, I'm wondering if you've looked at all into the effect of where metaphors are coined and how they enter the vernacular, because industry is only one segment and it could come from, you know, many, many different parts of society. So I'm wondering, what is the effect? How often do they come from different parts of society other than just industry? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the next step in this would probably be to do some kind of empirical look at like, okay, where's the like, where does this way of describing, um, for, so we were talking about um, data as an asset class, uh, as, a, as an example, uh, that kind of being sourced from like a comment on Metafilter and then like if you're not the, uh, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold and like how much that took off and was um, kind of uh, misattributed to people like Jonathan Zittern at some point. Um, that kind of being uh, a meme that's like effective because it really uh, gets at a core idea that is new and novel, but also um, a relatable way of describing it. So I would love to do more of that empirical, like choose a thing, like where does this data is the new oil thing start and where does it like do the kind of media mapping. Um, and there's some work at the Berkman Center, um, the media cloud, tool does some of that, and so I'm hoping to maybe uh, follow up with that, so in these more concrete ways. Um, so thanks a lot, Sarah. This is super interesting. Um, I had just one thought about some of the kind of alternative metaphors pr you proposed, the personal ones. Um, it was striking to me that a lot of them are very like ephemeral in nature, hmm. like the idea of a shadow or a reflection in a mirror, right, are like these sort of temporary um, like instantiations of yourself that you don't have any control over, they just appear and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody would, you know, make an argument that you have much of an interest in your shadow or that right. you should have any control. Like it's, it's an uncontrollable thing, right? Your reflection is not something that we like think about as being yours so much, right? It just is. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious about like, I guess as, as you point out, I think quite rightly, like it depends what your ends are, but if we assume that, that some of the ends is giving people um, maybe more like control over the data flows that you know impact them in some ways or that use their data. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about the like the how useful those metaphors are as opposed to sort of tweaking some of the existing like economic metaphors, like thinking ownership about and, yeah, yeah, thinking about property and ownership. I mean, as as much as I get like why those are problematic. It also feels like because those are the frames we've used, it seems like maybe a little bit easier from a policy perspective to say like, okay, well this is like currency, right? Or this is, you know, part of your, this is a product that you made, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is what you're either like analogizing it to work in some way or, or you know, to some extension of yourself that, that we would already recognize some kind of interest in. Mm -hmm. um, or the IP, like we, I've even heard that taken to the IP level. Like this is, you created this data with wearing this sensor device on your body, like is that your, you know, yeah. property intellectually or otherwise, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I think so that's, that's a, just, I don't have a question. Yeah, and I, I guess, um, I would love to figure out like, it, it, to your point, I think it, it still matters which, um, which, context you're employing it, right? Like, is it because you want to build a tool that lets you control your personal data uh, and have like uh, um, policies around like its 
okay to use it here and not there, the personal data store kind of uh, context? Or is it just to say that, like, guys, you need to understand that Facebook isn't free, you're paying with your data? Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, th thanks, and thank you. So, just reacting to the different metaphors for different audiences and about the data as a new bacon. I don't think a lot of vegetarians or Muslims would kind of appreciate that particular metaphor because there's a lot of culture packed into that, into that word. Um, Sorry, which metaphor? Data as the new bacon? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right, I mean, it's like almost addressing the hipster, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess programmers would like to eat bacon. Uh, but the other thing that I'm, I'm, I'm curious about is Genevieve Bell, an anthropologist at Intel, and personified data and gave these data as fetal. Data likes to look good. Data likes to uh, do that. So I was wondering your reactions to that. Sorry, and say that first one again. A Genevieve Bell, who's an anthropologist at no, Intel. No, no, I, I know. Yeah. Data is what? Data is fetal. So it's wild. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a fetal animal, a feral mm -hmm. fetal, however. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, what are kind of like the gender things that are going on because there's this thing called the Kiki and Baba effect where, you know, sharper words kind of tend to be more masculine and curvy, curvy words like Baba tend to be more feminine in nature and what, how does data play into that, into that entire landscape? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, isn't that the example of like, is this swirly our object, like what would you call this thing? Right. Is it, is this a Kiki or a Baba, right? Like this sharp pointy object or whatever, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that goes back to all the like cognitive mm -hmm. linguistics uh, stuff, which I am not at all well versed in. But um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think especially when we're talking about the naming conventions, like is this a friendly metaphor or is it a uh, like antagonistic one? Um, this is more of an observation than really than a question, but you know, Karen was talking about the, the data metaphors like the mirror and the shadow as being very evanescent and, and passing. But you can imagine a different context for a data metaphor, which is very solid. So you could talk about looking in the data fossil record, mm -hmm. which is things that something that if people are not doing now, they're certainly going to be doing 100 years from now. Mm -hmm. And that sort of flips, flips the conception of data as something that actually is very permanent, much more permanent even than you are. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, that changes, I think, your awareness about the data that you leave. Mm -hmm. Well, and that gets back to like, okay, what kind of a system are we describing here? Like, is it is it a system that has per permanent memory or is it Snapchat and like it is a data shadow, like you saw it and it's gone or like what are we trying to build? And so, Or more importantly, like which system would we prefer for what purpose, right? Yeah. Hey, so um, you showed the two slides. There was one with the exhaust mm -hmm. coming out. I'm just coming out like a sneaker or somebody's tailpipe or something? I think it's a tailpipe, yeah. Okay. And then there was the data is the new oil after that. Um, so like a whole bunch of thoughts kind of popped out as you were describing that. And then the phrase you kept using that like these are industrial ways of naming and thinking. Um, and how um, kind of sick it is that, um, that we're using those words and those precise metaphors about something that actually can be consumed without being depleted, which is data at the same time that we're actually doing that with things that can be consumed and will be depleted, like fossil fuels and stuff like that. So it's, it's really kind of sick, actually, um, that there's like all this bombast about the economic opportunity of that, you know, like borrowing. It's almost like taking like the language of colonization or something and like applying it to like another planet where, you, you know, you're not going to have to deal with the consequences. So like that being aside, but um, the thought that it immediately made me think about is um, cogeneration, right? So uh, in, in like industrial engineering, cogeneration is when you take a waste product from one process and pump it in as an input to another process. Mm. And it's usually heat. Um, so if you drive down the New Jersey Turnpike about 20 miles, you'll see the heat being sucked out of the giant, um, uh, what's it called, Bayway uh, refinery being pumped into some other industrial process. I can't remember. And they've got this big sign that says, like, cogeneration. And it actually is a great thing. And that's what, like, 99% of big data applications actually are, right? It's cogeneration on the data exhaust. Um, so 
but that then leads me to think is like, why don't any of these metaphors talk about systems? Why are they all just nouns? And why aren't they about processes? Um, and why aren't there more of those? Or are they out there? Um, or is it just that we're still like too stuck on data as the thing and not thinking about the things that operate on the data? I don't know. This is like the question I have with every uh, talk at Data and Society is like, why are we still talking about the data instead of the stuff that acts on it? Mm. Um, so I just wrote down a bunch of things like, is data like the interstate system? Is it like an airport terminal? Is it like an insulin pump? This is total random surfing, by the way. <laughs> More um, of this, please. Yeah. Is data like decomposition? Is it like the weather? Is it like a water cycle with precipitation and uh, whatever, uh, evaporation, and sublimation, yeah. the mystery process? Um, or is it like geological cycle, which has erosion and sedimentation and eruptions and all that stuff? Um, so anyways, just, right. it was well, very, it was, uh, thanks for that. It was yeah, very inspiring. I want to your point, I think the, the thing that comes closest to a systems metaphor is the, the carbon cycle one. Yeah. Um, as like this rep respiration between bodies and between um, entities. So. Oh. Yeah. Um, I don't know how easy it would be for you to show the slide again where you had the painting of the woman looking at herself in the mirror. Yep. So I was curious about that in relation to your argument because you focused on the mirror, but here as an audience, what we're seeing is we're actually seeing a lot more of the woman than she's seeing of herself. Mm. So in effect, personal representation going all the way back to the portrait involved a third party that did the representing. And so I'm not actually so upset about the industrial metaphor because I think there's something to be said that today we are being represented and the third party that's doing the representing, that's seeing us in a way that's beyond the way we see ourselves is industrial. So can I ask you to just make a little bit more of an argument for why you feel the need to personalize the data. Because I would actually say that the public being aware that the entities that make this stuff, use this stuff, and will benefit from this stuff are largely industrial is important. I, I think the politics of that aren't ins insignificant. Yeah, I, I think to the thing I take issue with is that we um, are accepting it as the position and maybe the thing to inspire by these other metaphors is like it's, uh, agency and like uh, uh, trying to do something also with your own data, right? Like the, a lot of what the discourse in the quantified self community is about like the data is out there and the industrial process has like created it and I still can't get at it and I want to do stuff to it as well. Um, so kind of in this, in this very, um, like, you can only see part of it. Or you can only see the, vi the piece of it that they're willing to show you, for example, like Fitbit. Um, so I think the, the motivation for me is the kind of empowering side of it, right? Like, that industrial process, I think, won't change, or the, the terms of what that industrial process looks like and our access to it won't change until we start kind of demanding other things to be different. Um, whether it's like I want the API for all of my data or, um, you know, Facebook should have some different data uh, um, retention policy. Um, so, so, yeah, I think it's, it's largely about like not just taking it for granted that this is like this is the way it is, but can it be different? Um. Yeah, so one of the things I think is so interesting about um, this idea of like the new oil, the new natural resource, is that these are all commodities. And an essential quality there is sameness, right? It's like a barrel of crude that I have is the exact same and totally interchangeable with a barrel of crude that you have. When in the case of data, it seems to me sort of the exact opposite. Like the whole value of data is its differentiation, is the patterns that it generates. If everyone in this room had the exact same data, then that data doesn't really mean that much. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really interested in this idea of a more personalized metaphor, whether it's blood or fingerprints or whatever, that kind of heightens that individuality unique to data. I'm curious um, 
what sort of forces potentially are at play here to try to strip data of its personalization? Is there something from a market perspective that is worrisome or dangerous if people start to feel greater ownership in the data that, in the data that they produce? Right, so I think um, a lot of the ways I think about this is even though we're talking about using data towards personalization uh, ends, like the results that we get or the um, you know, filter that we have on things, uh, it's still very much applied in this like mass way. Um, so the way that Facebook thinks about the store of data that it has is the, there's the individual potential, but it's actually just acted upon in a very non-personal, like non-actual, in, individual to individual way. Um, so again, I think it goes back to the kind of empowering aspect of things, like what do you get out of your data? What uh, kind of access do you have? Is it limited by the way that they have produced it and uh, uh, processed it and presented it to you? And do you have any other control over interpreting it in a way that's valuable to you? Or transferring it or what, you know, all these other things that you might do as an individual. Um, so again, thank you so much for this talk. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting way to think about how we think about things. Um, and I guess I'm interested in this idea of actually the other side of personalization, which is the people who are involved in making the data data. Mm. And so thinking about the, the sort of lack of metaphors that help us understand, you know, the people, the people who are sort of encoding this or making it make sense. Right. And so, excuse me, in that sense, if that's our end, which may be my end, blood is actually a really bad metaphor because it doesn't point out the role that is needed in transforming this sort of raw material into something usable. So like steel, for instance, in a way, at first I was like, steel, wait, that doesn't work. And then thinking, well, but actually there, there is something useful in thinking about steel because you think about all of the processes, all of the people that are needed to transform iron into a workable material. So I'm just wondering if you've thought at all about that dimension. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and a lot of it uh, touches on the kind of, you know, STS, like data is objective, data is like, what is, you know, the objectivity of data really, or how objective is the algorithm? Like it's all just people behind it, um, people interpreting it, people kind of applying filters on it. Um, so, so yeah, I, I am very much interested in like ways we can surface that so that it's understandable and like as a way of critiquing and you know unpacking the way it has been presented which is like it's objective it's the most like uh kind of concrete way we can understand the world around us pure. right right um and i think that in itself is uh you know maybe not a metaphor but certainly the framing uh that has been the dominant way that it's been so exciting and as a promise of what it's capable of, so. So I wanna pick up on something that somebody said over here and push back a little bit on the notion that we should be talking about data at all. Data is the passive object, not the active process of social control and social shaping and removal of power and agency and extraction of wealth. And I think that the more that we concentrate on data and try to understand what data is and what data does and what the right metaphors for data are, the more and more difficult it's going to be for us to actually look at and talk about those processes. So I think what you were saying about you know who makes metaphors and this kind of thing is actually really telling. The fact that we are all here having a conversation about data at an you know at a location called data and society is evidence that that social shaping structure has worked and that we have been successfully dissuaded from looking at the process of data collection and the process of um, you know, process-oriented social manipulation at scale as a direct violence that impacts our lives. Mm. 
And so, so I, should we be talking about metaphors for algorithms? And I very much invite that as part well, of Well, and, and the algorithm yeah. ends up being the other thing. That's the way that we take process and then turn that into a static noun that, yeah, it, that right. it, you know, and I see the same conversation happening with algorithm. And like maybe we're just going to need to keep picking words as they get as that process happens, where words become you know stripped of their politics. But I think there's something really interesting there about what is happening with the depoliticization. And I think that the data is weather thing is actually especially pernicious as a metaphor because it. It, yeah, it's yeah. oh, it's just it's just the weather. You know, this isn't this isn't something that someone is doing to you. It's just the weather. We've got three here, but I think I saw your hand first. So, well, following up on uh, that point, why, why? Maybe we should think about data is the ultimate thing, right? It's everything because it can be morph and shape. You know, my, the color of my eyes, your social security number, you know, my DNA sequence. That's all data. Uh, so maybe we should concentrate on the ultimate thing that data is. This is everything. Maybe that's one thing that we can talk about. Uh, we don't necessarily need to do, I think, what Frank Lutz did for, you know, that tax, you know, like, because his objective there is to sway the vote and scare people that will, you know, vote against their own interests. So are we, should we pick a metaphor that we'll use everywhere or we just pick and choose, you know, depending on, like you said, on the audience. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should also harp on the fact that data has this potential to be anything and everything. Thanks. So kind of going off the previous two comments, something that I was thinking about was that, I mean, it, it seems like what we're dealing with here is this, this massive amount of um, indeterminacy in what data actually is. And kind of going back to the pictures that you started your presentation with, you know, there's kind of these visual representations of data or the cloud or code or whatever, but you look at them and it's like, you know, what are they actually pictures of? And I think one thing that I was thinking about throughout your talk is like, what is the sort of rhetorical work that these metaphors are doing in stabilizing certain understandings of what data is? Because like what he said, I mean, it's kind of everything. And if you went around the room and asked everyone what is data, you would probably get a different answer from every single person. And it's indicative of, I think, just the amount of indeterminacy that exists around data you know, as an object, data as a process, all those things. And I think one thing that's interesting to look at with these metaphors is you know, when you say data is the new oil, oil is something you know, very material and it has a sort of set of established cultural and economic meanings around it. Okay, it's exchangeable, it's a commodity, whatever. And looking at, you know, who is pushing that sort of metaphor and like why is it, I think that talking about right and wrong metaphors for data implies that it has this sort of essence that I think at this point, I mean, I, I don't see that there. I see it as being more indeterminate and then these metaphors doing the kind of rhetorical work to stabilize you know, this kind of socially processed essence upon this thing. Yeah, I absolutely agree there. Um, to, to the earlier point, I think that is why I think spending any time, spending an hour talking about what the metaphors are is where the, the, why it's important because it is this intangible thing, it is this like indeterminate thing that we are trying to make sense of and so like the metaphors are one of the major ways that we are doing it and so yeah. I agree. On, on the claim that um, Eleanor made that you know we're not that we're only talking about data as a passive thing. I mean, we do have a very widely used metaphor, data mining, right, which talks about it as an industrial process and as a violent process. Um, data processing is such an, a you know such a innocuous phrase that we don't even really think of it as a metaphor, but it is a metaphor and it's processing in much the same way that you know we talk about processed food. Again, there's a kind of industrial aspect to it. A few months ago, a few of us were trying to popularize the term data fracking to suggest mining with extreme violence and producing all sorts of toxic byproducts of data. And, you know, the idea that by trying to dig up data in a way that's very invasive, you're, you're doing damage. I've also seen the, the term used, data fracking used in a kind of opposite respect, which is to suggest that the data that are produced from it are sort of a, uh, either, either a very low value or a very high value, depending on the context. Mm. Um, <clears throat> data scraping is another metaphor that we use to describe the process of how data are found and pulled out of something that where 
with some difficulty. So I think these metaphors do exist. The one, process one. one. Yeah. So the three that you just used, which were mining, processing, and scraping, right. rather than um, those are even like pre-industrial processes, right? So mining is ancient. Processing is I don't I don't know. Um, so rather rather than kind of moving forward m closer to our era where most of what the economy does to stuff is transform it in like really sophisticated ways. The industrial manufacturing economy, we're not even talking about like the data economy where it's transforming them in like incredibly sophisticated ways that the people who come here and tell us don't even say, claim that they don't even understand. So like, I guess what I'm saying is like, I don't see the metaphors of processes and systems that reflect the extreme amount of transformation that is happening to the raw material, you know what I mean? Like, and the, the examples that you used, uh, right? Like actually go in the other direction towards much simpler processes mm. that predate industrial So mining economies. is really just the extraction. It's like almost yeah. like we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So I guess I would say, yes, I mean, we, we also say things like data extraction, which implies going and pulling it out. We say data capture, which sort of implies that the data are passing by us and we're pulling them out as they go or we're pulling them from the air. We talk about data wrangling sometimes with the idea that data are difficult and tricky and you have to kind of wrestle them into shape. I agree with you. Maybe there isn't a really good one that describes the, incredible, the incredibly technical aspect of this process. Yeah, so maybe there should be one for those. I also want to throw in one more that's sort of related to that. We talk about data, when, when we talk about data trails and data exhausts and so forth, and we're talking about data as a very personal thing. I leave my data, and it's a question of like, how are people getting my data, and do I have control over my data? And that misses the fact that a great deal of what people find out about you is not based on your data, right? First of all, it's comparing your data with everybody else's right. data. Second, a lot of the data that exists about you are not data that you generated. They may be municipal data, they may be government data, and maybe things that were not in directly created by you. And so there isn't a metaphor, it feels to me, that gets at the process of what it is to discover the data about a person that were not necessarily generated by that person. And that is also part of this analysis process that we don't have a word for. Do you want to comment? And I see a hand back here. No, go for it. All right. Uh, the, right now, the language we're using sounds a lot like we are implicitly seeing folks in this room who get to talk about data in this way as like default industrialists and even like close to robber barons. I'm wondering if you've heard any metaphors from people who are at a different end of the spectrum, like um, people against whom data is used like a weapon, um, like the FBI and NYPD, you know, profiling Muslims uh, with surveillance or people who are like served predatory loan advertisements all the time. Um, is, there, is there any language that you've heard that comes from there and not from us? Mm. I mean, I think uh, a lot of people here are working on that. So if, if anyone who wants to respond to that. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head that are like super salient as this like jump. I think people start talking about the kind of big brother, the, you know, that kind of filters into the disciplinary uh, relationship, so. I just had one quick thought kind of related to this conversation, which is that, <clears throat> so I'm an English major, like you, and so data is the new blank, is grammatically incorrect, right? Like data is Latin, plural, um, Obviously, we Sing use it. Singular, massive noun. Uh. Totally, right. But I guess it's interesting a little bit to think about this conversation within the context of is data singular or is it plural? Because if it is plural, it opens up potentially new avenues for different kinds of metaphors. Data are water molecules. Data are, you know, points of light. Like, I think that even that decision, how we classify it, um, forces us maybe into certain choices um, and influences the, the kinds of visuals that we choose. Well, the, the very idea that it is now a mass noun suggests that there's a shift in the framing uh, 
from you know the way scientists used to talk about data um, as a plural, uh, and you know that being a vernacular shift that's happened as a as an as a indication of the like enormity and the kind of all encompassing aspect of what we think it is that we're talking about. So yeah, I, that's totally fair. Yeah. Hi, I had a question of like uh, like how the the means of which through these metaphors get communicated. Like, I think most of our ways of like uh, how the popular imaginary it gets processed is through like it's seen or like it's visualized or I read it. And I'm wondering if you've noticed any other senses, if that's a more effective way of communicating or educating through like auditory or feeling or like if there's a more tactile way of like educating people about big data in ways that like it, I don't know any examples and I'm wondering if you had any. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of that's happening kind of in art, more artistic spaces, which I'm not super well versed in, but I, uh, maybe Ingrid, you have any references if you want to bring up, but um, there's, you know, there's plenty of people experimenting with like uh, either portraits or like, um, trying to turn data into sound. I'm, tr I'm totally at a loss for who this was, but uh, somebody was taking their like activity data and turning it into uh, an auditory experience, like a symphony of all of the sensors that they were. Uh, Brian Coase, I think it's your thing. I think that's right, yeah. So there, I think, and um, Jared Thorpe is one of these people uh, who's also spending a lot of time on like how we represent this thing um, in ways that are slightly not linguistic, but um, kind of using other senses. So, um, but yeah, like, what does data smell like? <laughs> is that even useful to us? I think, uh, of course, as humans, you know, we're very prone to the like visual and uh, oral, uh, I guess, senses as a as a means of understanding the world. So, I think that's partly where the the focus does come from. So. Other questions, comments? It'd be great if we just standardized the odor as like, oh, it's just minty, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> just arbitrarily. <laughs> just a very quick headline I came across to uh, just now because I was kind of searching around for metaphors. Um, this, is on, this is a Fox News, it's actually an AP story, but running on Fox News under the headline, Vast Obamacare Data Warehouse Raises Privacy Concerns. A government data warehouse stores personal information forever on millions of people who seek coverage under President Obama's health care law, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So I guess my point is like a warehouse, we, I think some of us, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I guess I'm sort of um, in some ways taking Martha's position in that like a warehouse is, an, is in some ways maybe an industrial or uh, a kind of industrial metaphor. Um, but you know, warehouse will also get you through the winter, right? Um, you could put you could put grains in a warehouse, and and uh, and you know, it could be great for a community. Uh, um, in the in the but is that how they're using it? I don't think they're using. That? I don't think they're using it that way, and at least in that headline. No, they're right? not. They're, yeah, try, they're right. trying to make the opposite point. Right. This is this is this is. Um, I, Fox News is running this story because they want to because they don't like Obamacare, and they want to make a point right. that they want right. to scare people into thinking that Obamacare is bad. I don't think Obamacare is bad. I think I think it, 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 it there are there are benefits to the government having collected warehouse uh, it, having warehoused information mm -hmm. on on um, everybody uh, in in the country, right? Well, so so to some so my yeah. point is just is just that I think that what troubles us sometimes is the actors who are right who who are who are um, shaping the metaphors that 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 we use. Um, I think that's a perfect example, though, because like data warehousing is a thing that the computer like uh, storage side talks about, and so that's in that case, it's like you know using a, a positive way of talking about it in the industrial sense and like turning it into something for the purposes of Fox News to like make it a scary thing, um, it, which is I guess a perfect case of like the shift in that um, the meaning of that particular metaphor right yeah. but I guess my my claim is that you know the warehousing of data by Obamacare it, it, it might even be an apt metaphor for what they are doing mm. and it also um, and you know it makes sense to me and like my point is a warehouse gets you through the winter 
and and so that that <laughs> or can get you through the winter, right? And so data and, silo. And we so, haven't and mentioned so industrial silo. metaphors. Yeah. Do not necessarily have to have to have sort of a a, a, a troublesome thing. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, comments? I think we have time for uh, just one or two more, if there's anything else out there hiding. Ah, great. Yeah, I guess sort of on taking off from that point, what struck me, uh, so I used to be in online marketing. Um, so I guess I'm sort of like the target person, if you will, right? And um, wh what struck me is it, T the whole conversation sort of seems to imply that the sense of data is new, but I, but neurologically, it's what we do. Like, I see you and I make a split judgment about you. You see me, you make a split ju judgment about me, right? That's data on some level that, that I'm generating about you, you're generating about me. To then capture that, I don't know, is necessarily the evil. It's what you then do with it, it seems. So... For instance, like if when we are capturing data and, and marketing, if that helps somebody somehow, then that's seen as a good thing. If it harms somebody, then it's a bad thing. But sort of to your point, it's like th the outcome is sort of the problem, not necessarily the the capturing of it. The capturing of it can be sort of a, a natural process. So part, I'm, I guess I'm just really struggling with this conversation because to me, it sort of seems like this is sort of how we approach policy in general to say, well, if we just create the right rules, then we'll incentivize everybody to act in the right way. So if we just create the right language, then we can make sure everybody uses it for good rather than bad. And I guess I'm just sort of wondering, like, what's the limit of that philosophically? Because, like, we're all humans and we're going to use data differently in different ways, and that inherently is a natural process. Like, we all use sort of, we all understand the world differently in different ways. So it, I don't know, I, I guess I don't really have a question. I'm just, I'm struggling with the, the idea that this is sort of an, a new concept, um, rather than it sort of shining a light on an existing concept and moving from, from that point forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on the kind of observational side, I think all of that comes from like long histories of science and the way we think about observation and like uh, what you're saying, processing the observation and making meaning from it. Um, I think there was another piece of your question that I wanted to address. Um, but now I've lost the train of thought. Um, I'll come back to it. I lost it. Well, I, I, mean, yeah. I don't know if this is where you're going with it, but like just in kind of in, I think in building to or in responding on responding to your point, like to me the legs of this type of analysis rest on the fact that like in and you alluded to this earlier this morning that like metaphors I think don't tell us how to act right, but that Meta and they don't necessarily refer, in fact, they like specifically don't refer to new, they, they take new practices and they put them in old boxes and it's just a question right. of which box you're putting it in. And that actually really matters when it comes to like legal decision making, right? Like that's just explicitly the way judges and legislators, but especially judges, think about, you know, am I like how we're going to treat these new processes that we've never encountered before. So to me, like the most um, kind of policy relevant, like what do we do with this analysis, like application is the law, just because, you know, if we, and we talked about, the, I mentioned this already this morning too, like if we say a website is like a place of public accommodation, like a hotel or a restaurant, like that changes the rules about like who, what types of, of accessibility requirements we create there, right? So right. that's metaphor, but it's not just like, oh, like an interesting, like random conversation about like, you know, is it, a, I mean, like it, it has real consequences for right. people. Um, so I don't know, to, to me, like that's kind of the kernel of what, of, of the contribution that you're making is, mm. is to help, but not just to notice that we're using metaphors, like yes, we're using metaphors, like fine. Um, but I think that's the import of the metaphors that we choose is in like seeing how this application, you know, it doesn't tell us like do this good thing or do this bad thing, but it certainly does tell judges and lawyers 
these are legal uses of data and these are illegal uses. Right. And I think it goes back to the Lakoff and Johnson idea, which is like they are so they become so foundational that we take them for granted, that we don't think about them, that they are the way that we, you know, process this thing. And so I think where I'm interested in like the newness piece of it, and I think this is true in the policy case as well, is that you know, we are in the moment where we get to decide how we think about it. And so like thinking about all the pieces that are at play in trying to define what it is that we, you know, as a society have decided this thing is um, and what it's like uh, has real bearing on like what it looks like going forward. So I, I think that's kind of where the tension plays out. So cool. seems like a good spot to stop. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs>